Hey friend, welcome to today's podcast episode. And I want to talk about one of the hardest things in the world that I've ever had to do. And it was to step on stage and speak to people, a lot of people. And I, I was absolutely terrified. And for years I ran my business with pretty much no one knowing who I was. They didn't even know what I looked like. Uh, they didn't know that I was working in yoga pants and a sweatshirt because I did it all from the blessed privacy of my computer. And the first time I decided to actually take this huge risk and speak at a conference, I literally was rated the worst speaker at the event. Yes, the event host was kind enough to tell me that I was the worst speaker. I was kind of traumatized. I'm not going to lie. Even thinking about it makes me a little sick to my stomach, <laughs> but I allowed myself to learn and get better. And I've been asked to speak on some pretty darn big stages since then, like really big stages, Dean Graziosi, Russell Brunson type big stages. And yes, I'm still scared and I shake like a leaf up there, but I can get up there and tell my story so that I can help others live their own amazing stories. But you want to know something though? I know I can get better. In fact, I believe all of us get better as we keep sharing our stories, whether it's up on stage or in the about us section of our websites, which is why I was so excited that the wildly fantastic Colin Boyd is joining me today on the podcast. He works with some pretty darn big names, helping them understand their own stories and tell them more powerfully. He's like, one of those mind masters from the movies, he understands a reason why people do what they do and buy what they buy. So grab your notebook and pen. I've got mine because class is about to be in session. Let's go. Hey guys, uh, all the listeners out there, so so excited to be here. Uh, my name's Colin Boyd. You can hear I'm Australian, but I live in Newport Beach in California. And essentially, I help experts, content creators to sell effectively on a virtual or a live stage. If you've ever ran a webinar before, or if you, you've ever tried to do some Facebook Lives and the conversions have been really low, that's what I help fix. Mm, this is perfect because my audience, hi guys. Uh, they do a lot of Facebook lives and they do a lot of selling from their own stage. It might be in their home. And so I would love if you could dive in and talk about it, but okay, I'm going to be super vulnerable and ask you to a few months ago, I was standing on stage in front of thousands of people at yeah. funnel hacking live. I was super nervous and you were there and you helped coach me through some of the things that I was struggling with. So I know I'm going to open it up and I would love if you could critique I'm asking this because I know that you're super kind, <laughs> but critique some of the stuff that I was struggling with and then take it and then help others that are listening know that a lot of the stuff we're going through is very normal and ways to help combat some of that stuff that we deal with. Mm, that's so good. Well, I think this is great because Allison, like you're a rock star, even though you, you're even sweet. though you don't like to present yourself as a rock star, you are right. Like you've got a big community you make a significant contribution with charity, with your life, with so many things, and you live a big life. But what's really cool is, and I want to ask you these questions, is when you were coming into that presentation, mm -hmm. what were the unhelpful things that were going through your head so that the audience can probably, they'll probably relate very much. What were some of the unhelpful things going through your head? Oh, that's such a good question. So first off, my biggest thing is I'm so afraid I'll be over, all over the place. And that people won't be able to follow. Uh, another thing is how do I control my shaking? Cause I can create an earthquake on a stage. I, and then like the microphones, like bouncing in my hand, like sometimes put off this super nervous energy that I'm afraid doesn't look confident. Um, but I don't want to be snobby confident. I want to be relatable confident. And so I have these like, ah, like a pinball, um, these thoughts going in my head of like, how do I be relatable? And I just want to be in my sweats. And why did I wear heels? And why am I shaking so bad? And all the thoughts are just overwhelming me. Um, and it's, I, I have to keep going back of Allison. It's not about you. Who cares what you wore? Like, did you see me on stage? I'm gonna have to post a picture of this. I wore a green outfit and I literally look like a lime 
like a green bean and it, my face is green with it too. Anyway, so I'll go back to it and I guess I'll post that and be like, never wear green on stage. And this is why, but like all the things that go through my head, it's, it's like this, I don't know this boxing match, but yet I know that God, the universe, whoever is like, chill out and get up there, tell your story. I put you here for a reason. Now just go. And so, I mean, I, that was a loaded question. So I gave you a loaded answer on that that's one. Great. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, well, first of all, you know, I think that it's really normal to have those thoughts go on in your mind. And I know even for me, coming into a presentation, I have done thousands of presentations spoken on major platforms, coached like the biggest people in the world on it. And I still coming into a presentation, especially where I'm making an offer, I feel nervous. Like I find my mind going crazy, like crazy bananas, right? And one of the one of the principles that I that really helps me prepare. So if you're more introverted or you find yourself more reserved and you're afraid of getting on a any sort of stage, whether that's a virtual stage or a live stage, one of the first things that I that I do is I, I actually get really vigilant, very disciplined with my mind. And so I realize that there's a part of my brain that is doing everything it can to protect where my current life is at. Everything it, everything it can to keep me safe. And the challenge is that the stage represents unsafety. It represents initially, by the way, that's just initially, it represents uncertainty. It represents unfamiliarity. And whenever the brain sees that as being uncertain, it has, it has a threat response. So the threat response is it throws everything that it can at you. It will bring up all the old securities, insecurities. It will bring up all the old experiences. And a lot of it's unconscious. It will throw these rocks at you. And just so that it's because it's trying to not get you on the stage. Does that, <laughs> first of all, does this make sense? It totally does. Because I'm thinking about people that are going to throw tomatoes at me, wrong yeah. tomatoes. <laughs> Like, where do those thoughts even come from? But I totally get it because you're walking out and you're being so, it's so unfamiliar. Even if you do it a million times, it's not the same stage. It's not the same crowd. It's not the same anything. And so it is very unfamiliar. So that 100% makes sense. Yeah. So your brain's doing its job, right? It's doing its job perfectly to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that entrepreneurship, you didn't choose entrepreneurship because it was the so-called safe journey. It was the so-called proven path. And so anything in entrepreneurship, any magic that's created is always created in uncertainty. It's always created in the uncomfort, the discomfort zone. And so the stage, what I love about the stage is that it's a beautiful place where you can have leveraged connection, but it has inbuilt credibility. And so what I mean by that is because for me, a stage is any sort of visual or verbal experience with an audience. And so in other words, when they visually see you, they see what you look like, they see what clothes you're wearing, they see how you respond to the audience, they, they, hear, they obviously hear your tone, all that sort of stuff. And then they hear you and they experience you. There's this accelerated rapport that gets created. And so in an hour, you can create quite extensive rapport in terms of you know, response and rapport with an audience. But then because you're on a stage, there's this inbuilt respect that comes with the audience. It's just a subconscious belief that if you're standing on a stage or if you're talking to a group of people, then you obviously know what you're talking about. Now, whether you do or not is a whole, whether you think you do or not is a whole nother conversation, but there is an unconscious belief and unconscious acceptance in an audience that if there is a group of people listening to someone, then that person is an authority. And when it comes down to it, who do we buy from? We buy from people who we like and we trust. So the stage facilitates that. And so so the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I just described the stage as uncomfortable, uncertain, unpredictable, like all all the things that your brain doesn't want. So there has to be a reason why you would want to get over that stuff to actually be on it. And so I think, first of all, in your mind, you have to realize what are the benefits of actually being on a stage and actually being in front of people. And then one of the biggest hacks, which I had a conversation with you about, was... And this this really becomes prevalent 
when you come into your offer, when you're asking people to make a decision at the highest level in the next level of commitment in your program or something like that, or maybe it's a product or maybe it's, you know, you know, some sort of next action is that you must keep front of mind that the offer that you're providing the audience is not about you. It's about them. It's about their transformation. And the more empathy you can feel with your audience, the more feeling you can have in the things that they are challenged with and finding difficulty in, the more a presentation and a speech will feel more confident and comfortable with you. And so for me, whenever I come into a presentation, I will have all the monkey mind going on, like all the crazy stuff, you know, like what if they judge you? What if they don't like you? What if it doesn't go well? What if you run out of content? What if they don't like your content? Like all that stuff. And then I just say, thank you. Because my mind's doing, I'll go, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know you have a great little, like you've got a little system that you use, little formula, which you give over your fear. You say, hey, can you take my fear? Yeah. Right? It's like, can you take that part of me that wants to pull back? Because right now, like mama bear's stepping up. You know, right now I'm stepping up to the next thing, the next thing to show my audience of what's possible. And so when it comes down to it, it's like, if you remember that the whole thing is the whole presentation, the whole reason why you're up there is because is because of the audience. It's because of the purpose that's on your life. And that really helps you to get over it. I have one phrase that I use whenever I'm doing like a, a webinar or a presentation. And this is really important for the audience to believe is that your message must become more important than your fears. Mm. And when your message is more important than your fears, or your purpose is more important than your fears, then that's that's when you step up to the next level and and a, a stage is just a representation of that next level. I love that. I love, love, love that. And yeah, that's something when you talked about earlier, discipline um, your mind is when those monkey mind, when those thoughts, when those rotten tomatoes or whatever it is, is coming into your head, we have to go back to the message. Why am I really mm. here? Why am I showing up for Facebook live? Why am I going to go to an audience and sell my product? And it is the message. Mm. Than the and I think if you, it. if you look at it like this, and we had a conversation about this, which was the whole idea of, cause you were, you were doing a pitch yeah. and uh, you know, you're pitching this new program if you think about a pitch from the the fact that you're getting money from the audience, you, you're not going to feel confident in your pitch. And so you have to get to a place where you view the offer as not about them giving you money, is the offer has to be viewed as a sacred place of transformation, that your audience that you're providing to your audience to commit to. And in fact, they're not even committing to you. They're actually, what you're doing, your offer is a sacred place where they are committing to themselves on the next level. And you just happen to have created that environment where they can do that. I love that you say that. When I go and sell something online, a lot of times my team is like, Allison, what's your goal? What's your goal? And I'm like, my goal is to sell one. That's it. And they're like, come on, where's these big lofty goals? And I said, if I have these big lofty goals, it's going to be based on money. And I'm not willing to do that. What I want to do is be with my students at that moment Mm. and not live in the money space. And it really has helped me not only feel more comfortable, um, but also my sales have exploded, whether it's the physical or the digital product. Uh, So I love that you said that is find that sacred place of transformation. Mm. um, And it's your offer. Yeah. Your offer is a sacred place of transformation. Your offer isn't isn't them giving you money. It's you providing an environment for transformation. And money is just one of the currencies of commitment for the offer, for mm-hmm. the ticket to enter that sacred space. I know for me with, with our program, Self and Stage, for me, for them to enter that space, the reason why I charge money, the reason why you charge money is not so that they give you money. It's so that they're saying, this is the commitment that I'm I'm putting down on myself to go, this is how much this means to me to commit to my next level. And on top of that, there is time, there is commitment, there is energy, there is confidentiality. There's all these other currencies, energy. But when it comes down to it, money is one of the cleanest ways to identify commitment. Mm-hmm. 
I love that uh, currency of commitment. That's what money is. Yeah. Yeah. So if people feel bad about asking for money, don't, don't think of it as asking for money. You're asking for commitment. And the question is, what level of commitment do you want from your audience? Now, obviously, there's market factors involved with that, which, which is, you know, how much, how unique is your product, how unique is your offer, all that sort of stuff. But when it comes down to it, a higher price is just asking for a higher commitment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good. So good. Okay. So move on to your next thing. So we're, we're disciplining our mind. We're remembering that our message is more important than fear, than our fears. So making it about them. What else should we be thinking about? Well, when I think about you know your presentation, coming back to you, Allison. Uh, when I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I, one thing I am you, like, it's my goal to be better at speaking, especially on stages, because I always have felt like this journey that I was given was never for me. Hmm. It was given for me to share, and I'm like, I don't want to share. I just want to hide behind my computer all the time. <laughs> and so I love that you're pulling this out yeah. uh, and, and diving deep into it. And, and and I think that that's why your business continues to grow is because you genuinely care about your customer. And I think that there's a massive so lesson, massive lesson in that for all the listeners is that, you know, if, if I look at all the businesses that are around, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50, you know, or longer, because a lot of this industry is a bit of flash in the pants. Like people kind of get into it. They're like hoping to get rich quick. And maybe they don't hit their goals in the first year or two, and then they kind of lose interest and go into something else. But the people who actually see success in there genuinely care about the customer and they genuinely care about the transformation. And so, but what's cool about that is inbuilt in that, that makes you a better communicator because you you can't manufacture conviction. Hmm. What I mean by that is you you can't, there's a conviction that people feel when you genuinely care about them. And you also combine it with the fact that you know your product, your program, whatever it is, gets results. And so those things together of conviction and then also the the credibility of your program, that's the thing that they buy. They actually buy a feeling. And so the feeling is transferred emotionally, energetically from a stage, even, even virtual. Like, you know, if you watch, maybe you've attended a virtual conference or something like that. The second the 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 speaker gets emotional you can physically feel it in your body yeah right i don't care whether it's over the internet or not like there's energy just just instantly just transfers to the audience and so when you have conviction about about your purpose and why you're there and you combine it with a a, a program that has credibility that you've actually you know proven or You've gone through the process, at least maybe you're starting out, you've gone through the process and you think it's actually great as well. That sells. That's the thing because they're looking, your audience, the reason why they buy is because you represent more certainty than them. And so they've got enough uncertainty themselves. (laughs) They're not looking for more uncertainty. And so the reason why they buy is because you represent more certainty of getting to the outcome than what they would have in themselves. Now, I'm not even whether that's true or not. It's just that's the reality of what sales is. That's the reality of what good sales is. I think is that is that it represents that. And then I think when it comes down to it, it's the integrity of the program that sees the longevity of the of the expert or of the business. Is that if the program has integrity and the program delivers what it says it's going to deliver, then that creates the longevity of the actual program itself. Um, so that's that's more an energetic thing, right? When you're selling, mm-hmm. um, but let's come back to you, which was the st- I wanted to bring up story, and you had a great story about you know you've got all these amazing photos of yourself, like when you were first starting out with your your first boxes, and your you know like when, you know, back in the day when it's when it's all yeah. fresh, <laughs> it's all scrappy, right? You don't have the warehouses, you've got it in the got it in the garage, you got it in the trunk of your car, you're delivering it yourself, all that sort of stuff. And those the the story arc of of going from where you were to where you are now, that story arc uh, and that signature story, and there's this idea that that I love teaching, which is I've I've, call, I've called it infusion selling. So infusion selling is the concept of you sell while you speak. So you don't speak lots of really cool content and then sell at the end. Infusion selling is you sell while you speak, but it doesn't feel like selling. And so one of the techniques, there are about nine of them, but one of the techniques is signature story. 
And the biggest distinction is, you know, I think what you did really well with your presentation was, was you took people on that journey of going like, this is where I was to this is where I am now. The biggest mistake that people make with their signature story is that they don't align their signature story with the core premise of their presentation or of their offer. And it's the same core premise, by the way. It's not different. So I'll give you an example. So for me, my core premise of my program is that speaking on a on a stage, a virtual or a live stage, is one of the most effective ways to get a flood of clients, you know, instantly. And so like almost like to be honest, for me, one presentation changed the trajectory of my entire business. That was 13 years ago. And my job is to prove in my signature story that that happened to me and then show other people examples of it and then the offer aligns with it. And so for you, it could be, you know, physical products is the fastest and easy way, easiest way to get started in the infopreneur um, space and scale up your business to create the freedom you've always desired. Like, let's say that's your core premise. So you have to come back to your signature story and go, am I delivering that core premise in my signature story? Because most people think their signature story is about their journey, but it's not because your signature story, first of all, isn't about you. So your signature story isn't about you. When you tell it correctly, it's actually a representation of the journey your customers are desiring to go on. Mm, Okay. And the more you align your signature story with the core premise and have a clear core premise, then the more powerful your signature story is in selling your program without selling your program. So good. So good. So good. It's not about you. It's representation of the journey your customers are about to go. Mm. And that's why if, if you feel like if anyone's listening and they feel reserved, they feel shy, they feel like, I don't want to share my signature story. Like, I don't want to make this presentation about me. You're totally missing the point of a signature story because a signature story is nothing about you. Even though it's about you, it's actually got nothing to do with you if you tell it correctly. And, there, and what I mean by telling it correctly is you show that story arc from you know difficulty, vulnerability, challenge to a breakthrough moment to the journey you went on and the revelation that you had and you tie it back to that they're on that journey and that it's about this one revelation that you had, which was maybe it's physical products is the fastest way to do, you know, blah, blah, whatever your core premise is. While you're telling your signature story, your audience will be listening to you, but what they're actually listening to is their own story. And they're going, oh my gosh, that's exactly how I feel. And whether they've done it specifically in the niche that you're in doesn't matter because it's a universal experience of difficulty. It's a universal experience of struggle. And when they relate with your struggle, they have connection and then they see where you've gone to and then they have inspiration through the credibility, through the results that you've got. And then you align it with your core premise and then you have a signature story that sells. I love that you're encouraging them to relate with your struggle. The success is so hard for people to relate with, but Mm. everybody relates with struggle. Everybody relates with the thing that they don't have or the thing that they're going through. And so starting off with that is so powerful. Okay. So do people overshare their story arc? Do you see that? Yeah. I mean, I think you have to think about what's the purpose of it. And so you, you come, it's, it's almost like emotion. So I've seen people speak on stages where they get very emotional mm-hmm. and they go, they get, they, they're reliving their story, which is great, but it almost like overwhelms them too much. And, it, and then all of a sudden it becomes about them, like them feeling that emotion. And so one of the best reminders is to, whenever you feel emotional, is to remind yourself again, hey, this is about the audience. And that actually, I know for me, when I've got emotional on stage, I'll remind myself, is this serving the audience? And a bit of emotion absolutely is, but over emotion and, and, and think about it. Like if you're talking about like really specific details or something and it's too graphic or it's oversharing, then it always comes back to, does it serve the context of this audience and the context of where I'm taking them? And if it does, like if you're in the, if you're in a certain context, then it might be fine. But if you're in maybe a business context and it kind of has nothing to do with it you can still access the feeling 
Because remember, instantly they've got to feel it. And that's what it's about. It's not about the details. It's about the feeling of the struggle, the feeling of the difficulty. And then, and then you take them on that journey to the results. That's what it's really all about. So I think you can overshare as long as, but a lot of the times you have to see it in context and go, would this, is this context okay to share it in? Okay. I like that. I think that helps out a ton. Yeah. And how much detail you go into. I don't think you have to go into as much detail in some things if it's, um, if you find it's like very triggering, because you do have to be careful as well. Like, what things you share, like, because they can trigger things. If it's abuse, if it's emotional abuse, if it's, and you can talk about it and talk about the feelings, the the difficulty, but it's like, you do also have to be cautious of going, what emotional state do I want my audience to be in? Um, and what's the purpose of this story? Yeah. I feel like you used a word of the, of the year, I guess the last couple of years is triggering, right? I think so many <laughs> people are afraid they're going to trigger they didn't even mean to. So I love that you, you talked about that. How do you prevent triggering? Well, I mean, you you obviously can't because you can't control an audience. It's like with, you know, with if you're selling anything, right? You can't make someone buy something. And I mean, that is, if you get up to the edge of that, it becomes, it becomes too strong in manipulation. And then, and then you end up getting really bad customer reviews because you get a lot of people in your program who aren't a right fit. Um, so you can't, you can't control triggering, but I think you can, I can, you can be sensible, sensible about it and go, is this going to, and it really, you know, is it going to really trigger people in, in a negative way? Now, are you going to trigger someone? Probably at some point you probably will. Like, especially if you've got more than 50 people in an audience, you know, statistics will say that you'll trigger something, but the purpose, I mean, I think of a, a, a speech that sells effectively is to actually trigger people in 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 three ways. There's three things that I'm looking at, and when I say trigger, it's it's not about bringing up old, you know, old emotional, <laughs> you know, th- stuff that would come up or or physical things that would come up. I'm talking about triggering around. First thing is desire. Mm-hmm. So your spe- you have to think about your content and design your content and go. Do these points create a desire to to take action? to move forward in this area, to have a desire. So if you're speaking on physical products, you're asking the question, is this content, like the case studies I'm sharing, the principles I'm sharing, the stories I'm sharing, are they articulating the core premise and creating more desire for what I help people with? Right. That's the first question I ask. The second question is, is it reducing resistance? And so I always like to identify between two to three core limiting beliefs that people have and then reframe those limiting beliefs because it's like the handbrake and the accelerator. So the desire is the accelerator, the, the handbrake is the resistance. And so people might have had previous bad experiences with it. Maybe they've tried it before, it hasn't worked. I know Russell talks about, you know, the new opportunity. And so the new new the presenting your offer as a new opportunity as opposed to something an improvement of what was before actually addresses an objection of I've tried this before. Well, no, you haven't. It's a completely new opportunity. And so for me, I'm thinking about. But specifically, I'm going, what are the specific objections? I'll give an example. Like, I mean, for me personally, one of the objections is that people don't want to be salesy. They don't like if they want to learn how to sell on a stage, a virtual stage, live stage, they don't want to be salesy. They don't, they don't want to leave a bad taste in people's mouths. And they also feel like sales is uncomfortable. And one of the first reframes that I'll do in any presentation is that selling is the doorway to which you serve your audience. In fact, if you're running a business, it's the only doorway that you can really serve your audience in a for-profit business. Because even if you're giving to charity, you, you can't do that unless you're selling. So yeah. selling is actually the only doorway that you can truly serve your audience on the greatest level. And it comes back to the idea of, if you think about your audience, you've got people who don't pay, they're like your greater audience, and then you've got your clients. And where do you get your best testimonials on transformations from? It's not a true question. It's your clients. That's because serving at the highest level requires a transaction of the audience with you and because it just increases commitment. And so once people understand that, wow, so selling is actually how I serve my audience, then the idea of selling on a webinar or selling on a stage all of a sudden doesn't become about like just taking money from people. It becomes about, no, I'm just providing a doorway that 
that if they're the, they're the right fit, they can walk through and then I can serve them on the next level. Do you think that's where a lot of the like craziness in our heads come from is around money? Or do you think mm. it is based on experiences? Where do you think like the majority is? Mm. Well, I mean, I think it, I think money's a big one, a huge one, uh, especially with how you grew up around it. The, I know for me, I had a lot of emotional triggers around it growing up. Um, just a lot of scarcity, uh, even though we didn't have scarcity, <laughs> it was just it was just there. Uh, yeah, money's a big one. I think uh, just general like feeling judged, the fear of judgment is really strong in every human being. The fear yeah. of you know the fear of of being judged. Um, I think the fear of not being in the group yeah. is a big one. Of like the fear of being kicked out of the group because it's like oh you know you went over the line, you shouldn't have made an offer, you shouldn't have you know offered that next thing. So, but when it comes down to it, leadership is not in the group. Leadership is actually stepping out of the group. So to be a leader, there has to be a level of being willing to step out of the group. Uh, one of the examples I remember for me when I was in youth group, my youth uh, leader came over to me and she said, Colin, I feel like, you know, um, we were into bike riding at the time, uh, like road bike riding. And uh, they have a thing called a Peloton, which is like a group of bike riders and they ride together and, and it just makes you go faster. And she's like, I feel like you're in the Peloton and you you like to ride, you know, in that front Peloton and hang out with the cool kids, all that sort of stuff. But you never pull out of the Peloton and lead the pack. And she said, it's like you're 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 afraid of of standing right in the face of all the resistance at the front of the Peloton. And, and I think that there's this internal fear in people, which is, hey, if I pull out of the peloton, what's going to happen to me? Will I be judged? Will I not be loved anymore? Will I not be accepted? And because there's a real resistance that comes when you pull out of your pack. And I think selling on any stage or selling on anything is pulling out of the pack. And so there, there's like these unconscious things in us that are actually part of being human that we have to go against to grow. That's such a good vis- visualization of it, of, of you're not, we're not supposed to be in the pack and our mm. brain go back to that first one. Our brain is saying, no, this is why you need to stay here. It's mm. because you're not going to feel all the resistance. You got other people that you can depend on. And so I love, love that one right there is we're not supposed to stay in the pack. We're supposed well, to for me, it, it's, you have to take your turn because in a, a good, healthy Peloton, everyone takes their turn at the front of the pack. But some people aren't willing to pull out of the pack and, and lead the pack and because they want to stay in the pack in the protection of it. And so I think, I think it's good to have a pack. Like, you know, I know for us, we've been in a mastermind. That's like a pack, right? And you're in a mastermind, you're in a coaching program. But at some point, especially with your audience, you have to pull out of the pack and you have to show them that you're willing to take the resistance. And, you know, you're going to cop everything there. You're going to cop the wind, the rain, the sleet, the bugs, like everything hits you there <laughs> and it's painful. But you also get used to it and you, you start to love it. But then you can pull back in, recoup and then pull out again. So it's like that willingness to keep pulling out and, and doing what you need to do to move your purpose forward. So the pack in a business, would that be like your customer service? Give us some specific examples of when we're in the pack, who else should be in there? Well, I mean, for me, like the metaphor is more more around your comfort zone i would say is that is that it's okay to live in your comfort zone like for a certain period of time but you have to pull out of your comfort zone quite often Got and it. and cop the resistance for you to grow for you to move move the pack forward it, it, yeah it's it's more it's more a metaphor for a comfort zone um but i know i know that for me a pack also represents people who i'm hanging out with and and it, and there's different people who run faster than other people and so, you know, who, what pack you're in, which is why I always do paid programs and other programs as well, because nice. I'm like, as fast as they're going to ride, it's going to push me to ride, ride just as fast. Sometimes I feel like I haven't felt my comfort zone for years. Like, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is a comfort zone? Yeah. 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 And, I, and I see, like, I look back at myself four years ago, even six months ago, that Allison is totally different than the mm-hmm. Allison today because I keep stepping out of it. Mm. Um, and I, there was one moment last year that I remember I was feeling comfortable and I'm like, I don't like this feeling what's going on. <laughs> something's wrong. Something's wrong. 
And so it's interesting how an entrepreneur is sometimes like going back and feeling that comfort can actually be a, a bit of a warning, at least for me that yeah. maybe for a second, but then get back up there and take, take that turn to the front of the pack. Yeah, I, I really think it is. And I think that you can almost build an addiction to being out of your comfort zone and it, it becomes your comfort zone. At, 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 at a certain point, you actually train your brain enough that it becomes the new comfort zone. And, mm-hmm. and I think that, I know for me sometimes, you know, I'll have like an hour off or something and, and then I'll be like, okay, I've got to do the next thing that's going to like push me. You know, it's like, I've had an hour. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. yes. So now you've given some good tips about like before and what we need to talk about. Yep. What are some other things that we're missing? Or some things that I missed while speaking on stage. Yeah. And so, I mean, something that we worked on before was around moving the audience to make a decision. So most people think their presentation is about providing content, but your presentation is about bringing your audience to a greater level of commitment. Your, your presentation is about moving your audience to, to a greater level of decision, to, to work their decision muscle. And so one of the things that we started to do in your presentation, and I think we could, we could go to the next level in this, was really helping people to realize where they are with the content that we're teaching. In other words, one of the things that I, I do, it's, um, I call it micro decisions. So micro decisions are small moments of decision throughout the presentation so that when you get to the final decision, which is the decision to join the program or buy the product or whatever it is, that, that it's, you've, you've got a momentum of decisions moving into that as opposed to just nothing and then just, hey, buy my program. Right, that's just yeah. that's not going to work, and so micro decisions is is another infusion selling strategy that we use, which essentially is about embedding small decisions throughout the whole presentation. Almost every five minutes, six minutes, you're asking for a decision. Now that decision could be as small as, you know, who here raise your hand? Who here has experienced this before? So it could be like small things like that. It's just, and you, you could call that engagement. But for me, they are. They're like their decision moments of where the audience goes, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to stay with you this, this presentation. It could be turn to the person next to you and just share what, what you've got out of it. It could be, hey, stand up if you've experienced this before. Like that's a bigger decision, by the way, to ask people to stand up. You have to like gradually get them to. But for me, micro decisions, we uh, specifically around content is really going where are you on this journey? So maybe um, maybe you're talking about uh, marketing your product, right? Marketing your marketing your physical product, and going on a scale of one to ten, where would you say you are in terms of creating attraction marketing? Like attraction, as in like people are literally coming to you, or on the other end of the scale, like you've just got no one coming to you, right? It's, it's all like cold orientation. Where would it be? And people will rate themselves, and then you will ask a question like. Imagine if it was a 10, what would that do for you, how you would feel in your business, how, how you would run your business? I want you to notice how you would show up. If you knew that you were creating attraction marketing and you were just getting this flood of clients, how would that feel? Like type the first word in to, to share with me how that would feel. And people would be writing like amazing, like confident, excited, right? Because for me, I, I want them to get emotionally charged by this content not just like teaching content. And then the final thing is is a decision moment, which is, hey, can you commit to going after that attraction marketing? Can you commit to going down that journey of building attraction marketing? And people will be writing, yeah, 100%, I can commit to a show of hands. Who can commit to that journey uh, starting today? Who can commit to that journey? And so micro decisions are small, emotionally emotionally driven moments that that make that create more desire for what you can help them with. And it's built uh, very strategically around the content. And the content obviously should be built around your offer as well. <laughs> it's so, so, so that's one strategy. Yeah, micro decision. Another, like I said, another strategy is is um signature story, like using your signature story. And and I think the biggest thing is for the audience to realize that you ask that question, is my content helping my audience become more committed to the outcome that I can help them with through my program, through my product. And if it isn't, then it's just fluff. It's just in there for no reason at all. Your signature story, help them to become more committed, have those micro decisions every five to six minutes. And I love that they're 
it's not like, Hey, sign up for my program. Now mm-hmm. it's right in the comments or raise your hand. And that's something that, um, I forgot in my presentation was those micro commitments. Mm-hmm. And you're like, Allison, where are those micro commitments? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh no, I didn't think about that. So I had to go back into my slide deck yeah. and add them. So I didn't forget. Uh, cause I think it truly is essential that we get them to show up and participate and say yes over and over again. And your yeses just can be small words, their hand up, mm. some type of an agreement. So yeah, I love that you added that. Okay. So what else? We only have a few minutes left. Anything else that's absolutely essential. And then, uh, of course we got to tell everybody where to find you. I think okay. another thing that's essential is to realize that it's to realize that you're not selling a product, you're selling an identity. And so when you're talking about your product or your program, you want to talk about the type of person who uses that. What's their value system? What do they care about? What sort of life do they want to create? And so as part of your presentation, a great a great thing to do is closer to the end or I mean, even through it is, is first of all, you're going, to, you're going to be showing case studies of people who have who have gone through the process, who have used it, et cetera. And you want to draw out points from those case studies. It's not about, because remember, the goal is not make it feel like a sales pitch. It's it's to draw out learnings from the case studies. But you want to also draw out what does that person value? What, what's important to that person? Is it Was it family? Is it Was it freedom? Was it a desire to be independent? Whatever it is. And you want to be drawing out those things so that people realize they're like, wow, if I buy this product or use this product. The reason why I'll do that is not just to use the product is because I'm like Jenny. I'm, I'm so like Jenny. Like that's exactly how I feel. That's exactly what's important to me. And so when you talk about your program clo- closer to the end or your product is you're talking about those values. And, and one way you can do that is you can actually say what isn't going to work in the program. So you can say, Things like the reason why people say this program isn't for everyone. Some people might have seen that in pictures before. They say this program program isn't for everyone. I think most people, they don't understand why that's in there. The reason why that's in there, it's done in a moving away format, but it's moving away from the values that the person wants. So for example, if you're not committed to getting over your fears and making your purpose bigger than your fears, then this program is not going to be for you. It's not going to be helpful. If you're not committed to getting out of your comfort zone in the next, you know, three weeks, three months, and actually stepping up to the next level, this program is not going to be good for you. If you're not committed to creating a product that genuinely helps people, this program is not going to be good for you, right? And so what you're doing is you're actually repelling um, the very values that they hold dear. And when you repel, people move towards, it's like the opposite of pushing, right? And you say, this isn't going to be good for you. So, because and what, and this actually builds more believability as well. When you say that if you don't have this, this is not going to work for you. So, when you, whenever you say it's almost like a damaging admission, you're saying, this is not going to work for you if, if you don't have these values in order. And people will go, oh my gosh, I have those values. I desire that. I want to do that. So, I think this program could be a really good fit for me. And so that's the psychology behind the repelling of values or anti-values in when you when you um, going to about to pitch your program. Okay, so good. Right, where can people find you? <laughs> well, one spot is Instagram. Love good old Instagram, which is just at Colin Boyd, C O L I N B O Y D. Uh, I've got a podcast myself, which is called The Expert Edge, it's expertedge.com, or just on iTunes, Expert Edge, and. Uh, and I've got a cool guide, that a free guide that I think could be helpful for people, which we've talked a lot about story. And um, if people want to discover their signature story and start aligning it with their core premise, I've got a guide called the Sell With Story Guide. And so that's sellwithstoryguide.com. Um, so that's like a free thing that they can start using. It's a cool PDF and they can design their signature story straight away. I love that because that can go on about pages, that can go on Instagram stories, that can go on Reels. That can go all over the place once, because I know a lot of people are like, I don't have a signature story or my signature story doesn't even relate to what I'm doing. But I love that you have a guide to help people to find the one that they're actually supposed to use. And then seriously, everybody listening right now, you've got to go follow him on Instagram. <laughs> it is so fascinating. <laughs> like I know your wife helps you out a lot with yeah. this, but how you've made business 
so fun mm. and so so much humor behind it the one that i remember was you're saying if i'm talking to myself don't worry about it i'm just in a business meeting uh, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that and i was like that's it that's amazing. <laughs> yeah so my wife uh, as you said my wife helps me a lot with this and i feel like what my wife's done is she's drawn out my personality and so because my experience was i i was i used to be in corporate like you know, when I first started my career, I spent a lot of time in corporate and used to speak in corporate worlds. And I actually dialed down my personality. And I think my wife was like, boom, like pulled it out, which has been cool. <laughs> Good. I'm glad she has because it's phenomenal. Uh, give her a big hug for me. Will you? I will. I will. Okay. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate you so much. Hey, it's great to be on here, Allison. Well, my notebook is very full of notes from this conversation. I love Colin's message about how he shares it. It's just so incredibly so incredibly powerful. So what I want to do next, you've heard it before, is share my top 10 takeaways. And this list, I promise you, could be a whole lot longer. I had a hard time getting it to the 10 because they were so good. So here we go with number one, magic is created in uncertainty. Okay. That's a mic drop right there. Number two, What we provide isn't about us. It's about our customers. Number three, our message is more important than our fears. Number four, money is a currency of commitment. I'm just going to say that one again because it gives me the chills. Money is the currency of commitment. Number five, success comes in genuinely caring for our customers. Number six, people buy a feeling. Number seven, everyone. Yep. Everyone relates to a struggle. Number eight, selling is a doorway to service. Number nine, we're not supposed to stay in the pack. And number 10, we don't sell a product. We sell an identity. All right, go follow Colin on Instagram. His Instagram account, it makes me laugh. He's very, very good over there. Uh, you'll get a good chuckle out of it and then let them know that I sent you and how much you enjoyed this podcast. All right. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. Go out there, make that money, put it in your pocket. Why? Because you can. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye.